in January 2017, things were looking great. I had signed a deal with a production company in LA and we we had a sitcom all ready to go. They assigned a showrunner. At the same time, Connecticut Public Television was going to pick up um, a, a kid's um, a science show that I'd helped write and develop. I wrote the script. I was in conversations with a San Francisco ad agency for a cat food campaign. Everything looked absolutely great. And then one by one, each thing just dried up and blew away like dust. Early June, it's like, oh my God, what else can go wrong? And then two weeks later, I was diagnosed with stage four metastatic melanoma that had spread to my brain and my lung. Hey, it's David Levin and welcome to another episode of Pop Goes to Culture. And as I promised recently, we are pivoting. We are gonna be talking more to some of the people behind the scenes in the TV and film industry. We are going to be trying to help you out if you are in a place where you're trying to pivot yourself. And we are going to be looking a little bit at the history of broadcast, cable, uh, internet, TV, and how we got to where we are today. So for that, I'm bringing on a friend of mine, um, Alan Kaufman, in his 44-year career, he's worked in every role imaginable, production assistant, producer, film and video editor, videographer, lighting guy, sound guy, hair and makeup artist, prop person, wardrobe, actor, show creator, screenwriter, and occasional director. He's worked in both adult films and children's TV, but he won't say which he prefers. So please welcome Alan Kaufman. Alan, welcome to the show. David, it's my great pleasure to see see you today and to be here with you. Thanks for having me. Uh, great having you. So, Alan, I want to sort of go back a little bit in time. Um, you've done a lot. You've worked for Nickelodeon. You've worked in, um, I guess you would call it streaming or internet TV, digital television. And your career has spanned, like mine, has spanned a lot of different uh, genres and a lot. Of, and you've done everything. I guess I've also done a little bit of uh, craft service also, in addition to everything else that you have in your... You all have. Uh, um, but let's get started with, with you when you entered the industry. Now, we're both around the same age, and we both entered when broadcast was still the thing, and cable television was mostly just to get people cleaner signals. And then they started saying, hey, let's create some content of our own. And you... That's, a, that's around the time that you got started. Tell me a little bit about your start in the industry. When I was a little boy growing up in New York, I'm 66, it was a show on Sunday mornings called Wonderama. And the host, Sonny Fox, would very often take the viewers and the kids in the studios behind the scenes to visit a TV studio. The control room, the cameras in the studio with the old turrets. I was completely intrigued by that. And then in second grade, as a field trip, my class went to Hofstra University to visit the TV studio. I was extra intrigued. Then in high school, I was in California. I went to the set of the Waltons on Warner Brothers. And I always knew I wanted to work in television and or film, just something in the media. Uh, I was an English major in college, worked at the college radio station, got out in 1980, which to me was, as the joke has always been, 1980 was a piece of the 1970s that broke off into like 1980. That summer, I was <laughs> looking for work. I would do anything to get a job and ended up through an ad in the back of a casting magazine called Backstage Magazine, working on an adult film set in the prop department and um, was fortunate to graduate to the sound department on that same project. But I learned as I went. I didn't have a formal education in film or television and got very lucky. Following that, I ended up at a small boutique production house in Manhattan that did TV commercials, um, did the, the old Be All That You Can Be campaign for the Army and some other things. Oh, yeah. And I learned a lot. They gave me a lot to do. And I was very fortunate to learn and travel and do. And eventually, I ended up at Nickelodeon. And that, um, that tour of duty was 13 wonderful years. And that's where I think I learned the most about the most of everything was it was Nickelodeon and my days at MTV networks. What, what kind of stuff were you doing at, uh, at Nickelodeon during your 13 years there? I worked in what was called production management, which was the division that would take a script. I was in short form, a promo, um, a short film, take the script, 
create the budget around it, the production plan, hire the crews, the studios, the locations, secure parking, catering, wardrobe, hair and makeup. It was a great job if you looked at it as a creative endeavor in which everything was a creative problem that needed to be like, required creative problem solving. And that's how I, I pursued it. I ended up as the director of production management. And it was the old thing where I kind of rose above my level of expertise, meaning I was meant to do production, not manage others. And that's what kind of like when it fell apart for me. I didn't want to manage people. I wanted to manage productions. But by the time um, my, my dismissal and the kind of clean house at MTV Networks, it was time to go and it was on to the next thing. It's 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 interesting how many people uh, are are elevated beyond the thing that they love to do into the thing that they where they supervise other people who are doing what they love to do. It was an interesting process. I mean, I'd stroll onto the set, the people who reported to me, and I'd, I'd sit and watch and you know keep my mouth shut or try to keep my mouth shut. I was made to do production. I love to make things. Even in my old age now, I've taught myself Da Vinci Resolve and all the disciplines that a modern filmmaker, video maker needs to have. And you know, I've taught myself, I acquired some good video gear. I love to shoot and edit. And in, in the third act of my professional life, I can I hope to do it. I've been writing and doing other things, but production has always been my love. When I live in Queens and Forest Hills, and very often they shoot Blue Bloods in the neighborhood and SVU and an occasional film. I always gravitate to the set, get in the way, hear the walkie-talkies, the guy, that guy with the ponytail, get him out of the shot. I get in the way because I love it. I, in my old age, also secured my SAG after card, started acting. I love to be around production. That's that's fantastic. Uh, me too, by the way. It's 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 just so much fun. Um, things have changed in the last, well, certainly in the last couple of years. I I mentioned it on a on a video podcast that I did recently, and um, it's getting harder for people to find work. People like us with a lot of experience, and and people at the beginnings of their career. Uh, somebody said to me recently, yeah, for the people at the beginning and at the end, it's like, it's tough, but people in the middle, it's even worse. Um, so you and I have have had the pleasure of wearing a billion different hats. When we first started, it was very rare that you got to wear more than one hat at a time. Sure. Uh, one of the things at MTV Networks was that you got to wear a bunch of different hats because everybody did everything um, there. And then they, people got started to get siloed into or pigeonholed into one thing or another. Um, let's talk a little bit about what happened right around the time that YouTube started. The YouTube revolution changed everything for a lot of people. And today, YouTube is one of the things that people are actually making a living at. Uh, you were there at the kind of at the dawn of YouTube with Next New Networks. Tell me about Next New Networks, what it was, and how you ended up getting involved there and what it was like there. Well, prior to joining Next New Networks, I was at a leading women's cable network. And at the dawn of YouTube, I made my goodbye video and sent it out to everybody at place I was working. So it made me realize, okay, YouTube's got this power to it, to share, to make. I knew some of the founders at Next New Networks. Um, Herb Scannell was at Nickelodeon. I knew Fred Seibert. I knew a few of the other people there. And I was looking for an opportunity. I sensed that the world was changing in the production realm from television to, to this YouTube thing that I kind of embrace and love. My first YouTube video was my fish tank my fish swimming around. I've got over 4,000 <laughs> videos on my YouTube channel. It's still there. It's amazing. It's like a record of my life. But when the invitation and the opportunity arose to join Next New Networks, I jumped. I mean, working for Fred, working with the other guys there, I was given the chance to set up the studio, create the production environment there, nurture all these kids who are half my age. I resolved that like, no matter what, I'm not going to be the old guy in the group. I'm going to blend in. In fact, at a, at, at a conversation I had with one of the founders, they said, you know what? You need to grow up a bit. I mean, I was responsible, but in order to be creative, you have to have a good time. And part of my job description was to make stuff, 
to make sure people were making stuff 24 seven. We set up a studio, we bought cameras. We were always out on the street and the videos were very you know, specific. They were micro networks. There were, it was a channel for automotive, for fashion, for comic books, for popular culture, for film. Um, it was an amazing place to be. And it was like a, being in an incubator. I taught so, myself. Be, 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 before we go too much further, I want to set up a little bit of exposition. You know, the the the, the YouTube was a was the Wild West. It, it, it still is in many ways. And um, Fred Seibert, who helped found the MTV networks and helped found MTV and helped found VH1 and helped launch relaunch Nickelodeon and helped launch TV Land and and just was like a master of branding. And he saw. Um, he saw what was going on in in the internet as something similar to what was going on in, and Fred will correct me at some point if, if I'm getting this wrong, but he saw what was going on at YouTube and said, hey, we could do something similar with YouTube that we ended up doing with MTV Networks was to sort of brand a whole bunch of different channels and bring a little bit of organization to it. Um, so if you could talk about that part of it before we sort of get into what your experience was because i think people it's been a long time since next new networks and and even next new networks kind of evolved because youtube saw the the value of it but talk about what the vision was for next new networks as it was explained to you when you first got there it was explained to me that we would create micro networks on a budget it's very specific, um, I guess, endemic. Is that the word? I mean, where mm -hmm. like fashion was fashion and automotive was automotive. And the monetizing of each network was based on, you know, for cars, automotive products like oil and the, the, the wax to clean your car. You create the networks, have the viewers and the interest, invite others to make stuff. And again, this was like creating this, this viewer, this interactive viewer um, uh, uh, experience where viewers were sending us videos of their cars or their comic book collection or their wardrobe that they had made, the crafty stuff. Um, it, it was an amazing way to participate, to take the, net, the, the internet and share both ways, not only make and send out, but also to get back. And I realized that we went to the first car show um, when that, uh, we went to, see, when Fastlane Daily was making its daily show, we went to the, for the New York Auto Show and we were embraced by all these fans and viewers who were just happy to see us and realize that we were making a difference. I thought the vision of YouTube would be to make anybody, any kid with a camera, any adult, any person with a camera and a computer and some basic knowledge of editing a producer. Everybody was instantly a producer. And that was part, I think, of the fundamental uh, thinking behind Next New Networks is everybody can make something. And we're going to just make lots and lots of stuff. So what was the, what was the, uh, what was your experience as you watched Next New Network sort of start to happen and people were starting to think about, okay, let's run some ads and let's see how we can monetize this and let's see how many viewers we can get and let's see what kind of quality we can do. Talk about the evolution of the programming, the evolution. And, and again, it was a small company. It wasn't like having thousands of people like MTV networks did by that point. And it was a startup. So everybody kind of did everything. Um, and you got every person sort of got a really good firsthand look at the evolution of this thing. Talk about the evolution, the early, early days and, and what started to happen over time. It's interesting when you get a group of people, different ages, different experiences. You know, you had Herb Scannell who ran Nickelodeon. You had a bunch of other, you had Fred Seibert. Then you had a guy like me who did production. It was the ability to tap into resources and each and every person working there and expect from them to do five or six different things. And, you know, when I sat down in my initial conversation with those guys, the, 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 the senior staff, they said, you're going to supervise, but you're also going to make something. And that's when I realized the production world had changed because traditionally, like at a place like, like Nickelodeon, somebody would write it, it would go to the production management group, they would shoot it, it would go to another group and it would get edited. Everything was done by the same person. 
and the technology was allowing that to happen. And we had these little flip cameras and with, with a MacBook Pro, you can have Final Cut. You were a complete studio. And it made me realize, even in the years since I'd first gotten into television, how the technology had permitted all this to happen. But I think when we first started, we weren't quite sure. You know, set up a studio. Well, what does that mean? How much do I want to spend? A couple of lights, a camera, and a couple of kids on a computer. Then as the networks grew and the interest grew and we realized the things that were relevant to a viewing community, things got bigger. Next new network started with Fastlane Daily. Then it was three other car shows. There was a comic book show. Then there was a culture show. The need to make people happy, to satisfy a viewer, to, to, to respond and to just keep creating. I think it was all about making stuff. And there was an expression I should use it, but I shouldn't. Not good, good enough, which meant just make <laughs> it and move on. Yep. I always yep. love that because in the Internet age, it's, you're watching something on a screen this big. It doesn't have to be beautiful, color corrected, da 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 Make it next, make it next. It was like a factory. And I love that because it gave us a chance. It was all about, it was like punk rock. It wasn't about being a virtuoso. It was the message. And I always thought of it as punk rock. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't fabulous cinema. It was punk rock. And that was what I thought was just the marching orders to me. It's just make it and go. Not good, good enough. What's your favorite thing that you made while you were there? It was always the animal stuff. I was doing squirrel videos. I bought a, you know, the other thing was I'm a guy who used to see cameras this big and now I'm buying a little GoPro that big, setting up, setting it up outside my house with a bunch of bread and just seeing what comes in front of the camera, nibbles and runs away and then editing it to music. And I just, it was like going lob, like, you know, going fishing or like lobstering where you put the trap out and see what you get. I just love just getting random things and organizing it into like a two minute promo um, video, you know, piece of cinema. I just love making stuff quick and easy and then just getting on to the next thing. And the great thing was, you know, when you worked at the networks, it would go before everybody for review. Oh, I have to look at it. I need a revision. Next New Networks was an absolute pleasure. You made it. That was it. There wasn't a committee giving it approval. It was next. You know, I was I loved it. It was just. The complete antithesis of my Nickelodeon experience in terms of approval and the whole chain of command. What was there the most surprising? What was what was the most surprising thing that uh, that you found while you were there? And what was? Let's start with that. I was amazed how malleable people were. People put into a position they had no clue on, like how, how to handle. Um, I remember specifically, hey, you got to shoot this. The editor didn't come in. Can you make it? Can you, we need this was like for a deadline for Fastlane Daily. The ability to just step up and be willing to make a mistake and not worry because mistakes were totally part of the process and welcome because you learn from the mistakes. I was always a guy because, you know, when you're a production manager, you're, tr you're a born worrier. That's what makes a good, good producer. You worry about everything. I learned not to worry as much, to concentrate on the stuff that really mattered, which was the creative process, the message, the smiles it would bring to people when they watched the squirrel eating a piece of rye bread, you know, stuff like that. I, you know, it's, it was relevant in terms of the bigger picture in the, in the television world, but we really thought we were going to, like, create something. And, you know, I, I watch YouTube videos now, and I, wow, you know, Next New was really something. They eventually went to Google, and I guess that's a conversation for one of your other interviewees. But like, Next New had its three years. They tried. It didn't make the money it needed to to make everybody happy, and off we went. Happier and smarter, though. I really it was learned a, it a lot. Was, it was a moment in time. Let's call it that. Uh, David, we, when you and I worked together, and we were like always like, wow, what are we doing here? How do we do this? And like, we realized <laughs> it was great knowing people like you had the same basic like life experience and work experience. Like. Holy shit, how did we get here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was fun. While I was doing it, it was fun. And I got to meet some some really good people. Some of those people went on to some major things. I mean, it's just crazy. Yep. And, um, you know, I, I keep in touch with a lot of those people. And I had a chance in the next my, my in my next tour of duty at Epics to work with some of the next New Networks guys who I hired through Epics to do some stuff, DIY filmmaking. And those guys are still cranking stuff out. Justin Johnson just released a, uh, just released a documentary this week. Mm. He's making stuff. It just, 
it's great to work with people who are young and learn from them. And that was the thing I always loved. I always felt welcome. I was learning as I went. I didn't, you know, I, again, I made it a point not to give too many speeches, just to take it all in. And maybe that was my own undoing, that maybe I wasn't strict enough, that I was having too much fun. You know, when you have a job that's so great, a little thing in your head goes up, this is not going to last. And I knew yeah. all along it wasn't. I just, well, I you know, for me, what I really liked and did not expect to like as much as I as I ended up doing was was kind of being a mentor to people unintentionally or otherwise. Like I didn't want to be a I was a boss and a supervising producer. I don't want to be a dick boss. And sometimes you have to be uh, just because that's what the job entails. And I learned that the hard way sometimes. But I also learned a lot from the people I was teaching and and I was stunned years later when they would thank me because like I would say one random thing that I hadn't even thought about. You know, I had one person say to me, you said this one thing to me and it was like it made all the difference in my entire career. I'm like, I said that? Yeah, it sounds like something I would say. Isn't that but, remarkable when that happens, when you forgot you said it and somebody remembers what you said to them that made a difference? It, you know, it makes you it makes you feel good at a certain at a certain point when like you're like, oh, nah, I don't think I made a difference. It's like that Twilight Zone episode with the teacher and all the dead students come back. Uh, luckily, our students aren't dead. But, you know, talk to me about. You know, you've had you've probably had we've, we've you and I have talked before. Talk to me a little bit about some of the little sort of interesting anecdotes, things that happened to you during your, your career that you said, I can't believe this happened. I can't, you know, you come home from work. Every, some Most people come home from work and say, you can't believe the day I had. But in our business, when you say you can't believe the day I had, sometimes it involves famous people or famous incidents or famous moments. What's what are What are some of yours? You grow up watching television, the three networks, the way we did. I Dream of Jeannie, The Odd Couple, The Brady Bunch, The Partridge Family. And then you find yourself with those characters in a, in a real life situation. I worked, I did a lot of work at Nickelodeon for the marketing department, both Nickelodeon and Nick at Night. And Nick at Night would do these unbelievable events, um, one of which was taking an old bus, painting it like the Partridge Family bus, getting Shirley Jones and David Cassidy to show up during lunchtime on a Wednesday matinee day in Times Square to do a whole concert and presentation. And we did it on a Wednesday. The weather was beautiful. The cops were out and traffic was backed up past Central Park. And the woman from marketing, whose name I won't mention, but she knows who she is if she's watching, said to me, I'm so glad you got a permit for all of this. And I didn't say anything. And I said, hmm, hmm. We had no permit. I'm thinking, fingers crossed. I, I learned right then and there, if you pretend you're supposed to be there, especially with the cops and the people of the city of New York, then you belong there. We were there without a permit. And I went home and mentioned that to my wife. Said, You'll never believe what happened today. But, you know, the other cool things were like we did a promotion for the odd couple. And there's Jack Klugman and Tony Randall in the green room during lunch. And Jack Klugman had gotten tomato sauce on his shirt. And there's Tony Randall sending me out to get seltzer you know, from look what you did to your, I'm in the room with Oscar and Felix. Literally. And yeah. It was like, it was crazy. And I had another situation with um, the Brady bunch. There was an event at the Waldorf and all the Brady's Florence Henderson, everybody was in a room and I walked in, there's the brothers and some of the sisters and, and Barbara Eden and Larry Hagman. It just, you'd find yourself injected into these sitcoms and it was wonderful. You know, I I just I just love these moments where like I can't believe I'm here doing this. I can't pinch, believe I'm the in this room. moments. Yeah, and you know, I still I I'm a production guy. I love being around that stuff and where I live here in the neighborhood, there's always production. And I just, you know, wow, you know, I just I got to be around it. And I still, you know, I, again, I I call it the third act of my career. You know, you get to a certain age um, I haven't worked in a few years because I, I I'd been unwell, but I'm better now. And just like, Good. okay, what am I going to do next? Um, I had done some TV work prior to getting sick. I played a homeless person or a drug addict or um, a, a psychiatric patient on a lot of different shows. I was on a season of Gotham. I just love seeing this stuff. It, I went from being behind the camera to in front of the camera. I'm trying to write. I'm just trying to keep myself relevant and injected 
and filled with opera. You know, the, the, the idea you wake up in the morning, what's today going to bring? Will that screenplay I wrote get read? Will that sitcom I did get picked up? Uh, get, get picked up? It's always keeping in motion. And that I learned from the days of Nickelodeon and at Next New Networks was always stay in motion. Always, always. Don't stop. Crank it out. Not good. Good enough. That's great. I, that is that is perfect advice in this day. You know, like I, I I found there came a point in my career where I had to pivot like every, uh, let's say, six to nine months because things were moving fast. And now things are moving so fast that I feel like I'm pivoting every hour on the hour. I feel like I'm spinning like a Michael Jackson dance move. God, is that even relevant now to say a Michael Jackson dance move? Well, when um, you have, uh, you can just YouTube, you know, Google it and you'll find it. There will be on you. There'll some M Michael Jackson somewhere on YouTube for you. Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, what do you, what would you say to people, you know, right now, the, the, the places where you and I have worked Paramount plus, which, which has it, which was back, back in the day, it was called engulf and devour as far as Mel Brooks was concerned, but they basically Paramount plus incorporated CBS and MTV networks and a whole bunch of other places, just like Disney is now owns Marvel and star Wars and this and that, and Warner brothers discovery. And, and all these places are letting people go as of this recording, Paramount let a ton of people go today. I, I mean, like thousands of people are losing their jobs and, and those people are wondering if they're ever going to work again. And I don't know if I have any advice other than to, well, be ready to pivot, you know? And there are people, like I said in my video a couple of weeks ago, that people are getting their real estate licenses and they're becoming life coaches. And some are working in, you know, at Starbucks and some are becoming greeters at hardware stores. I mean, we all do what we need to do to survive and to work and to make our lives better. Um, there is no shame in going out and making a living and, and feeding your family. This is the greatest thing. But we all started out, those kids who watched Wonderama. I was actually on Wonderama with Sonny Fox, and that made a huge difference in my life. And I, I just only want to do this. And so the pivoting becomes part of it, but I also remember what it was like to mentor people. And I also remember what it was like to sort of help people find their way, help people navigate to what they really want to do. I remember there were a couple of guys and at an MTV, it was always, you had to be on the producer path. And there were a couple of guys who were like, I don't want to be a producer. I want to be an editor. And they became editors and that became their career and they loved it, but they had the opportunity to explore that and now people have the opportunity to go out with their iPhones and make stuff for YouTube and people will see it, even if it's shitty, uh, they'll get to make those mistakes. And now there are a million tutorials on how to, uh, how to have a YouTube channel and how to, how to learn to edit and how to use Final Cut and how to use DaVinci Resolve and how to use Photoshop. Oh, you don't want Photoshop anymore. Now you want to use Canva. And now you're going to use the AI is going to do it. And people are upset because AI is going to take work away from us. We are, we are at a point that is so radically different from even when broadcast was upended by cable and even when cable was un upended by YouTube. We are at the next revolution and it only took about 15 years to get here. So the overarching advice that you gave, which is to keep waking up in the morning, especially you who spent a couple of years sort of out of it because of, because of what you were going through on your illness. But what would you say to people? What are the best active things, you know, the three best active things that you can think of that someone could do right now, based on our experience, based on your experience, that someone, what actions can a person take right now to make sure that they're ready for the next part of their career, whether at the beginning, middle, or end? Reinvent. Make something every day. I don't care if it's a thing on your phone, paint a picture, produce something every day so at the end of the day, you made something. Um, I found it useful for me. It's the reinvention, but it's 
be productive. Always like, you know, I've got a bu- of all my friends, the guys my age that we're writing, we're like, okay, nobody's going to hire us because we're too old. But if I write something, if I do an essay, if I shoot a video, even if I like shoot it with my phone, edit it in iPhone and upload it that way, that I've made something. So somebody says, so what are you up to? Oh, well, you know, I just wrote, I just wrote a thing. I just edited a thing. I just shot a thing. Even if you're not making a dime, I, my, the joke I make every day is I'm working, I'm just not making money. And I know it's easier for me. I'm older, my family, my kids are grown. Always have something to do, a project, something that you're making, doing, showing the world. You show it on LinkedIn. You know, I'm a big social media guy. So if you follow me on Facebook or Instagram, you'll always see a painting I did, a little essay, a cartoon. I think it's very important to keep your brain as active as possible. And you'll feel better too. That is fantastic. And if somebody wants to make some money, any advice I, there? I know. My 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 quick my 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 quick narrative wasn't in, in January 2017. Things were looking great. I had signed a deal with a production company in LA, and we we had a sitcom all ready to go. They assigned a showrunner. At the same time, Connecticut Public Television was going to pick up um, a, a kid's um, a science show that I'd helped write and develop. I wrote the script. I was in conversations with a San Francisco ad agency for a cat food campaign. Everything looked absolutely great. And then one by one, each thing just dried up and blew away like dust. Early June, it's like, oh my God, what else can go wrong? And then two weeks later, I was diagnosed with stage four metastatic melanoma that had spread to my brain and my lung. And there's nothing like a good case of cancer to make the lost sitcom not feel as bad. I mean, I'm making light of it, but the point is, it's like, there's always something that's going to be worse, I think. And in my own experience, and again, I I promise I'd never preach or give a sermon, but like, you know, every new day is a gift. Just embrace it the best that you can. And, you know, production is wonderful, but the television and film suck, especially in this day and age. You know, when people are still losing jobs, working people with families, it's awful. But just like, have something that you're working on that you can say you're doing just even if it's 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 just an appearance you're creating for yourself be relevant to yourself before anybody else alan i can't think of a better way i can't think of a better way to close things and i want to thank you for coming on and i hope you'll come on again and we'll get some questions from the audience next time i hope so this was enjoyable you know it's it's i you know i say it's not good to talk about yourself but sometimes you hear yourself saying things and like you have a revelation and my, my my revelation is I'm glad I've worked as long as I have. I'm glad that we're reconnected, David, because you were one of the good guys at Next New. You were really one of the people I'd see and just enjoy having you around because we would just like compare notes. You know, Same having here. a common life, you know, it's just it's it's a wonderful opportunity to just uh, to see you again. So thank you for having me. Well, you know, it's always good to stay connected with the people uh, that you've worked with and that you've uh, that you've enjoyed. And I've really enjoyed talking to you. Now, if you want folks to uh, to be part of our shows, we're going to be doing some live episodes where you can actually be part of the show and you can talk directly to some of the people we are talking to here. You can also just type something into the comments. Um, so when we go live, we will let you know if you are uh, one of my Patreon uh, people. We're rebooting our Patreon. We'll, I'll be rebooting uh, channel membership on YouTube, and because uh, I got to make a couple of bucks also. So you know, for, but for a couple of bucks, you'll get to talk to some people who can actually give you good and practical and specific advice to you, as opposed to general advice. So um, so do it. At the very least, you can like and subscribe and share this because that'll help me out even more and it doesn't cost you a nickel. And I hope we see you again on the next one. Um, Sometimes it'll be somebody famous from the pop culture vault. And sometimes it'll be somebody like Alan who has a tremendous amount of wisdom and experience to share. And sometimes it might just be me. But whatever it is, uh, I promise I... I promise to double down and to do more of these. And if you like them, great. And if you don't, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, If, if you want to learn more about uh, working in the industry, here's a video you can watch. And if you want to subscribe, that would be over here. Okay. Talk to you later.